My girlfriend and I went to visit an abandoned haunted mining town. There, we saw a child's bike all burnt and old, as it used to belong to the town before it caught fire. We thought it was creepy, so we went past it into one of the buildings. When we were in the building, my girlfriend heard a bang, and I heard a bike bell, so we went back outside to find the bike gone. With all char marks and residue gone, like it never existed. We continued walking around and found a more creepy building, and on the ground was some litter and a real amazing doorknob that when we closed the door, it fell off the burnt wood. For safekeeping, I put it in my bag with intention of putting it back on the door, but while exploring, I completely forgot about it till we got home. My girlfriend lives in a Victorian house which has been maintained in its original state, except the additions of modern technology and furniture. So later, the next night, we began hearing chairs move upstairs and footsteps before the back door flung open and my girlfriend's dog were going wild barking at the stairs. We called our friend who said there could have been a ghost that attached itself to the object of the door handle. We planned to take it back and fix it to the door to respect the spirit and apologize for removing it from the ghost town. But right now, my girlfriend is hiding under the blankets as we listen to door slamming and footsteps from the landing. For the past two weeks, my family and I have been traveling around various countries in Europe. Unfortunately, we had our passports stolen in Belgium and had to make a couple last minute changes to our plans. One of which included booking a hotel in a new city for one night. We stopped just for the night between trains in Cologne, Germany. I helped my parents find the last minute reservation online and it was a pretty standard apartment style rental. When we arrived at the rental, we were all impressed by the views of the nearby cathedral and church spires, the shingled roofs, just the general feel of history that the whole town had. We went out for dinner and came back after dark, all heading to bed for our early train the next morning. I shared a room with my little brother and my parents slept in the next room over. I remember asking them if we could swap rooms because I didn't like the layout of ours. There were too many doors for me to feel comfortable. I have a weird thing where I don't like sleeping near doors and I can't sleep in a room with any doors left open. Anyways, they said no, we could just stay in the original room which had doors to the kitchen, hallway and two closets. I was too tired to push it and I figured my fatigue would override my personal habits. So I just got ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. While I was sleeping, I remember having some cycles of regular dreams. Then all of a sudden, I woke up with another dream. I was lying in the same bed in the exact same room and my little brother was lying in the same bed too. It felt like if I had just woken up normally. Now, I have very vivid dreams sometimes, but I never dream about being in the exact room I'm in. And I never wake up to a dream within a dream. In this dream, I was sitting up in bed and so was my brother. I could feel that for some reason, we were both really scared and there was this charged and anxious feeling in the room. I remember my little brother saying, what is that? Get out your flashlight. At the same time, we were both looking at the far end of the room where it was darker and away from windows. It was like we were both too scared to speak, but I could feel that we were both sensing whatever dark energy was at the end of the room. I started to fumble for my phone flashlight just for some light, when all of a sudden this thing, the closest I can describe to it as a dark blob of energy, moved super quickly over next to my side of the bed, and my brother and I screamed at the same time as this thing rushed up next to me. That's exactly when I woke up for real, around 2.30am. My heart was racing, and I was sweating so hard despite the room not being hot. I was so unsettled that I turned on all the lights in the room and didn't sleep for about two more hours until I could finally somewhat relax and drifted back to sleep. The experience was very disturbing for me. I never wake up in the morning for no reason as I usually sleep throughout the night and rarely if ever have nightmares. Now I'm wondering if anyone can comment on a phenomenon like this. Can people have paranormal encounters in their sleep 
while in certain spaces? Was I just having a vivid dream? Or was that experience a signal that there was something in that space? So all of these things happened in my now ex-boyfriend's house. I would spend a lot of time at his house overnight as his neighborhood had more things to do and his bedroom was more private than mine. We were both 19 to 21 during this time. First, I should mention that his family practices the Yoruba religion and would leave water and offerings for individual deities. They were very in tune to that aspect of the universe. I had almost felt growing up that I could feel things and spirits. Not necessarily communicate, but I could feel them and acknowledge them, and was generally chill and not scared, as long as I knew I wasn't doing something to upset them, and vice versa. I would have the thought of, oh, that's a ghost, and kind of move on. In this house, his bedroom had a door that led down a flight of stairs into the backyard, and also into the basement. He has a washer dryer down there, and further in was storage. It was a dark, damp, concrete floor. Not a place you want to hang out in. Occasionally, we'd go down to get the laundry, and I always found myself looking into the back of the basement, and just knowing I wasn't welcome to pass any further than the dryer. Even at the dryer, I can only explain it with clear words popping into my head. You're not supposed to be here. It was my own voice, and I would always leave quickly and sometimes give a nod of respect towards the back of the basement. I avoided going down as much as I could. Additionally, sometimes when in bed late at night, I would hear creaking on the stairs. At first, I summed it up to an old house settling and changing with temperature, but over time, I couldn't deny that it was the distinct sound of footsteps. It would always stop by the door to the basement, and I would stare at the door waiting for it to open. It never did. One day, we were sitting at the kitchen table with his mom and dad, and I don't remember how it got brought up, but I mentioned that I always felt unwelcome, and like I wasn't supposed to be in the basement. His mom and dad shot a wide-eyed glance at each other, and his mom said very matter-of-factly, there's a ghost of an old man who stays down there. I immediately felt validated and got chills and described exactly where I felt unwelcome, and she confirmed that he does hang out in the very back of the basement. She also told me that she will leave a shot of whiskey for him when his activity picks up, as he's apparently cranky by nature and it seems to calm him down for a few weeks. She said he was harmless, but I already felt that. He just didn't like me in his space. She left some whiskey for him the next day and I think I spoke to him and somewhat told him who I was. The feeling of unwelcomeness never left and I would still hear creeping on the stairs, but I made sure to acknowledge him when I went to the basement and never went into his space at the back of the basement. My papa was a Vietnam veteran and suffered from severe PTSD. Lots of things could cause a flashback, from a pot dropping on the floor a car backfiring in a parking lot, or a helicopter flying overhead. He was also exposed to Agent Orange and battled cancer for as long as I could remember. When he died, he only had half of a lung on each side and was still fighting cancer in other areas of his body. He took a lot of medication multiple times a day, but he was still a wonderful grandfather. He made sure I understood my worth, not just as a girl, but as a human. He also made sure that I knew how to defend myself he took me with him everywhere, and once he got too sick to leave the house much, he bought a video camera so that I could record all my performances, softball games, and high school ceremonies so that he could still see it all. Obviously, the two of us were extremely close, but by five, I knew what to do when he was having a flashback and what medicine to give him and when. We were close enough that 90% I was the only one who could bring him back to the present during a flashback. Other family members used to yell and tell my mama to keep me away from him during these episodes, but she'd always tell them to hush and that he wasn't going to hurt me, and he never did. Another favourite thing of my papa's were white bulldogs. He absolutely adored them, and they were always named Fred, 
even when he had three of them at once, they were all Fred. It became a running joke in the family, with my uncles no longer calling him dad, but instead Fred, and he often returned the favour. At family gatherings, once everyone arrived, all you'd hear for a few minutes was, Hiya Fred, how's it going Fred? Where were the kids Fred? I wasn't talking to you Fred, I was talking to Fred. As kids, this used to crack my cousins and I up, and for other reasons, you could see the women roll their eyes and walk away grumbling. This is important to the ghost part of the story. My papa passed when I was 18. My mom and I were at a horrible time in our relationship and she refused to let me go to the VA hospital and tell him goodbye. We all knew he was dying and he knew it too. The day he died I was in my room destroying everything because my mom refused to let me go. I felt a hand on my shoulder and when I turned my papa was standing there smiling, healthier than I'd ever seen him. He smiled wide and said, Do you think I'd leave without saying goodbye? Then I heard the phone ring and knew it was Mama calling saying he was gone. Fast forward nine years and my son had just turned two and was playing with some toys in his room. I could hear him talking, but it was more like a conversation, not just playing. I went in and saw him laughing and asked him who he was talking to. At first, all he would say was friend, but after a minute or two of pushing, he finally looked at me and said Fred, and at this point he'd refused to ever even look at Big Hero 6. I froze, because while I'd seen my papa many times over the years, I'd never really talked about him with my son, and we certainly didn't have any friends with that name. I asked him what Fred looked like, and he helped up one of his army guy toys and said, this, but old. I didn't say anything else. I was emotional but mostly happy that my son got to meet my papa. Over the next week, he continued to play with Fred. I asked once why I couldn't see him, and my son said, for me only. That night, I took the picture of my grandparents out of the back of my wallet and laid it on the table. The next day, while my son was eating breakfast, he spotted the picture and snatched it up, yelling, Fred. He did eventually stop playing with Fred and never said anything about it. Three and a half years later, we had my daughter and my son mentioned Fred a couple of times and life continued on. When my daughter turned two, she also began playing with Fred, but she called him Fred Pop Pop. She told me one day that he was my Pop Pop. What makes this all even better for me is that three of my cousins have also talked about their children playing with Fred. And we loved it because when we started having kids, we all wished that he'd been around to meet them. I still see my papa in my house from time to time, but he mostly just walks around and looks in on the kids and then smiles and leaves. Then a few days later, one of my cousins will message me saying that Fred stopped in for a visit. So now it's our joke that he's just making rounds, checking in on everyone. The sister that died before I was born. I have four siblings, but only three of them are alive. My brother was born in 1986, and in 1989, my mother gave birth to Haley, the one that died. When my mother was seven months pregnant with Haley, she was taken to the hospital because the doctors thought she had appendicitis. She was operated on, and the next day, she went into early labor. After three months in an incubator, Haley was brought home and things went well for a few weeks after they brought her home. Until one day, when my mum went to check on her after a nap. She was unresponsive. My parents drove her to the hospital, where it was discovered that Haley contracted golden staff and had fallen into a coma. Haley died a few days later. The infection wasn't noticed by the doctors before her discharge. My nightmares as a child. My earliest memory is when I was still a baby, not yet on the solid foods. I remember crawling on the floor and my brother was next to me with something in his mouth. Then, mum handed me something and instinctively put it in my mouth. Monkey see, monkey do. It was roast chicken. Not the store-bought kind, the slow, oven-baked chicken, marinated with potatoes and pumpkin that makes the whole house smell divine. That was the first solid food I'd ever eaten, 
and I can still remember the confusion and surprise of the taste. It was delicious. When I was a teenager, I told my mum about this memory and her reaction to this was strange. I expected her to tell me to stop making up stories and give me a scolding for trying to get attention. But instead, she stood up and walked to her room, beckoning me to follow her. When we got to her room, she pulled out a box from a cupboard, sat it on the bed and began rifling through it. I knew better than to ask what she was doing, so I instead just waited and watched. She was pulling out what looked like little trinket boxes and random assortments of miscellaneous objects I assumed had sentimental value. And she pulled out a stack of photographs, flipped through them and stopped at the one she was looking for. She handed me a baby picture I'd never seen before. It was me and my brother. I was about eight months old and my brother was three years old and we were both sitting on the floor eating chicken. My mother had a picture of the first time I ate solid food and I could see the surprise on my face in the picture. The same surprise I remember feeling when I tasted it. I tell you this story to give you a better understanding of my brain and the way it works. My brother is on the spectrum, and I suspect that I might be as well, but I've never been tested. When I was very young, maybe four or five, I remember having these nightmares. I was in this never-ending nothingness that terrified me. It was dark, and there were these big circle things. I don't know how to describe what they look like. I can see them in my memory, but if I try to draw them or describe them, I can't. They sort of look like massive coloured spheres, floating in pitch black nothingness. I had this same nightmare every night for, I'm not sure how long, until I learned how to change the channel. That's what I called it. After this, I went on all sorts of adventures in my dreams. Only sometimes, they didn't feel like they were my dreams. Sometimes I'd be somewhere I'd never seen before, with people I didn't recognise, doing things that felt like someone else's memory. There'd be people I'd never seen before, but somehow I knew them and they would recognise me. Like I'd been there before, and I had a sentimental attachment to the people and place. But I'd never been to those places or met those people. I never felt scared when I had these dreams, so I just let them play out. I was never in the same place, and I never dreamed about things that happened in my life. Not even a skew with memory. Always in different places, with different people doing different things. And they always felt like a memory, but not my memory. I don't know what to make of this. I might just have a good imagination, but who knows? The Scary Room My younger sister Molly was born three years after me, 1993. And my mother would tell the story a lot while I was growing up. Sometimes after mum would put Molly down for a nap, she'd wake up screaming and staring at this one area in her room. This was when she was a newborn and it continued until her toddler years. For whatever reason, she was scared of something in a room that clearly nobody could see. The haunted house. My childhood wasn't very stable as we moved around a lot growing up. I was born in Queensland but moved to Victoria with my mother and brother when my mum was still pregnant with my younger sister. I was two and a half. One of the houses we lived in, I was seven at the time, was the last house at the end of the road that connected to the highway. The highway had a bridge that went over the railway tracks and our house was before the highway with the railway going along the side of our property. Even though we were so close to the highway and railway, it was surprisingly quiet from what I remember. The area, primarily farmlands and small towns like the one we lived in. Not long after we moved in, strange things started to happen. We would hear what sounded like someone reading a newspaper coming from the kitchen, but there'd be nobody there. Or we'd hear coughing, but there was no apparent origin to said coughing. One night, me and my siblings were staying with our dad and our mum was home alone. Mum was in the kitchen when she heard banging coming from the door leading to the laundry room. The banging slowly got louder and louder and my mother, rightly so, was terrified. She was a stickler when it came to locking the doors at night so she definitely locked the front door. But the banging wasn't coming from the front door, it was coming from the other door. The banging persisted for a few minutes when it abruptly stopped 
and it was quiet again. When she went to investigate, she discovered that the front door was still locked, and there was no way someone could have exited out the door without being heard. It was an old house with really creaky doors, and there were only two doors in the house. The front door that we rarely used, and the back door, and none of the windows in the sunroom opened. Then I started seeing something in my room at night. Me and my sister, four at the time, shared a room. There were bunk beds along the far right wall as you entered the room, and a window on the far left wall that looked out onto the front yard. I slept in the top bunk, and my sister in the bottom, giving me a clear view of the door in the window. I had this beaded curtain that hung on the inside of my door, so I would hear it if someone opened it. In hindsight, it probably wasn't the best idea, considering the other weirdness that had been happening in this house. Late at night, I would hear the chains rattling when the door was closed and stationary. My sister was fast asleep in the bottom bunk. The window was always closed, and my mum was such a light sleeper that she would have woken up if anyone was out of bed. Sometimes I would see what looked like a shadow of a figure standing next to the window, but I could never get a good look at what it was. I convinced myself that it was the moon casting shadows or something, because I sure as shit wasn't going to leave the safety of my bunk bed, past the door with the talkative beaded curtain, and towards this unknown thing standing next to the window in the dark of night. So I'd lay there looking at it while pretending to be asleep. It never moved or changed position, and I'd see it even if the curtains were closed, so it couldn't have been the moon casting shadows. To this day, I have no clue what that was. I didn't sleep with a nightlight, so it wasn't that. Maybe my overactive imagination. Who knows? Other weird things happened in that house, but this is long enough, so I'll leave it there. The old house and the crazy cat lady. Around the time we were living in that house, our dad purchased a property up in the mountains, a few hours drive from us. The house was really old. My guess, it was probably built in the 50s. Bare bone brick and cement with an old wood fire. A chimney big enough for Santa's tush and even a wombat under the veranda. The property was a 20 minute drive up the mountains and was on 100 acres. Nothing spooky happened there. Unless you count me almost getting rear-ended by a bull or the wombat incident. But there was crazy Mary who lived in a run-down cabin in the mountains. Picture Eleanor Abernathy running at you screaming and throwing cats at you. That was the vibe I got every time we drove past her run-down cabin. I don't think I saw her that much when we drove past, and she mostly kept to herself, but the locals knew to stay away from her. This was back in the early 90s, so safety standards weren't as prevalent as they are today. My dad had heaps of old paddock bashers and tin cans in his arsenal, along with a few old posty bikes my brother liked to drive around the farm. My brother is a bit of a menace when it comes to anything on wheels. I remember standing on the back of Dad's Butte while he was driving into town on what was a dirt road back then. It was a gorgeous summer day, and the tree was as far as the eyes can see, and the occasional kangaroo spotted through the tree line. I was looking at the trees when something caught my eye. It was the flicker of a light from the corner of my eye. I looked over to see what it was, and I saw a white box. It was only for a second, and was gone as fast as it appeared, but it was... Stunning is the word that springs to mind. The auras. My entire life, I've seen these weird specks of light in my vision, similar to migraine auras or what you see after you rub your eyes. They're objects of coloured orbs in front of me that I see all the time. Sometimes they move and change shape, size or colour, but mostly they're just there in my visions and don't move. As a kid, I called them my imaginary friends and thought that everyone else saw the same thing, and it was normal. But when I'd mention it to my parents, I was accused of making things up to get attention, which is why I never mentioned them again after that. My mother started abusing me when I was six, so I found comfort in writing from a very early age. And these auras sort of became a safe place for me, something nobody else could see and therefore couldn't be taken away from me like so much that my mother stole from me growing up. I suffered a spinal cord injury and brain injury when I was 17 in 2007. The auras have stayed the same 
for change when I get stressed or if I'm grieving, when I get a migraine or during a panic attack. But within the last few months, these orbs have started getting bigger and I started to see something different. Something I have no logical explanation for. The foggy figure. Around the time that I noticed the orbs changing shape, I started seeing this, I don't know what it was. I first noticed it when I was leaving my kitchen. I was going past my fridge and I saw something in front of the fridge. It was roughly the size of a person but with no distinguishing attributes or outline. It was translucent and like looking through clear contact. When I first saw it, I thought it was a trick of the light or something, so I moved to the other side of the room to look at it from a different direction, but it stayed there, motionless. I closed my eyes for a bit, and when I opened them, it was still there. I was confused as fuck and brushed it off as stress or something, until I saw it again a few days later. This time it was near my front door. I was on my way to the bathroom when I saw it. The same size and shape, but unlike the first time I saw it, this time it felt like I was being watched. My heart started racing and my skeptical brain was going haywire trying to conclude a logical answer to what I was seeing. Of course, my brain drew a blank. After this, I started seeing this figure a few times a day, usually around the same spot right near my front door. And then I started seeing it at night. When I saw it during the day, it was like a translucent fog, but when I started seeing it at night, it was the same fogginess but a lot darker. And instead of standing upright, it would be hovering over my bed. I never got any negative vibes from whatever this was. If anything, it felt like it was trying to protect me or help me. I didn't mention this to many people, but then something weird happened. A friend was over at my place one day, and when he was about to leave was when I saw this figure standing in its usual spot near the door. As he walked to the door, I saw the figure move towards him. Right as my friend walked through it, he stopped and said, Ooh, I just got the chills. That was weird. Up until this point, I convinced myself that I was seeing things. But that, well, I explained everything weird that had been going on and what I was seeing feeling somewhat unsettled by what had just happened. He was rightfully shaken by this, especially considering what he just felt. I haven't seen the figure for about a month, but every now and then I get the feeling that I'm being watched. Or I'll smell something without an explanation to what the smell is or where it's coming from. I.e. I'll be somewhere alone and not moving and I'll smell something that shouldn't be there. Like the distinct smell of perfume with no origin to the smell but sometimes the smell will be different, like shoe polish or the beach. I believe that this entity is still here because I think my cat can see it. There'll be times when I'm at home when I get that familiar feeling of being watched. I don't see anything, but my cat will perk up and start staring intently at this one particular spot, right near the door where I saw it before. Keep in mind that there's nothing of interest there, just a few boxes, a fold-up table and my TV. The alarm and ghosts from my past. This is my most recent spooky encounter and what's prompted me to share all of this weirdness with you. A few weeks ago, there was an alarm that kept going off at 12.52 a.m. It wasn't until day three that I figured out what it was. My digital clock had been set to that time, but I didn't set it. I don't even know how to. The, that afternoon, I received a message from a guy I went to high school with informing me of the passing of a friend. Me and Greg had a history that I won't get into here. Greg died at 12.52am that night, after my clock went off for three nights in a row at exactly 12.52am. Freaky. The number three. A few people mentioned the significance of the number three, which got me thinking of how often that number is in my life. My grandparents, dad's parents, had six kids, three girls and three boys. My parents had three kids and we were all three years apart, 1986, 1990, 1993. My mother's birthday is September 3rd. My sister's birthday is August 3rd. 
and my best friend's birthday is July 3rd. My birthday is October 9th, 10, 90. But 91,990 divided by 3 equals 30,363.3 recurring. Greg's birthday is April 23rd and he died at age 33. Death in my life. I've experienced grief a lot more than most people have, but I'm not looking for sympathy, so please save the condolences. Shit happens, and that's that. I don't mean to sound so blasé about it, but I find it easier to be blunt about things like that, rather than get into details. So here's a list of people that have died in my life. My sister died before I was born. I died when I suffered a spinal cord and brain injury when I was 17. The alcohol in my system was the only reason my heart was able to be restarted. When I was 19, my dad and uncle died in a plane crash. I was 24 when my grandfather died of a stroke after being in a diabetic coma. I was 29 when my other grandfather died of emphysema. When I was 31, my grandmother died of ongoing health complications. Three months ago, my old manager and friend died. I found out about a month ago that a friend I went to school with died, and a few weeks ago, my friend I'd known since high school died from brain cancer. This happened a couple of months ago. It actually makes me sick to my stomach to think about. I was sitting at my kitchen table in my usual spot. My six-year-old daughter was on the second floor of my house in the upstairs living room, more or less right above my head. She was loudly shifting through her Lego box. To my left of the table is the underside of the staircase to the second floor. I can't see who's on the stairs or the top or bottom of the stairs from where I was sitting. If you were descending the stairs, the door to the room we use as an office is directly to the right across a short hallway from the bottom of the stairs. From my chair at the table, I can see the entire hallway between the bottom of the stairs and the door at the office. I can also see a sliver of the interior of the office. As I was sitting at the table and semi-listening to the noise my daughter was making with Legos, I heard someone start walking down the stairs. I wasn't really looking towards the office, but I saw the back of my daughter's head as she walked into the office. Or so I thought. A few seconds later, I heard someone start walking down the stairs, this time louder than the first time I heard it. I realised that something odd had just happened, so I looked towards the hallway. I watched as my daughter walked into the office with both her hands full of her Lego creations. I hurried over to the office and looked inside. My daughter was the only one there. She was putting her Legos on one of the desks. I asked her if she came down to the off and went back and came back down again, but she said she hadn't. There wasn't enough time for her to go upstairs again and come back down. Also, I would have seen her come out of the office. I didn't see the face of the first daughter to go into the office, but the height appeared about right. The hair colour and length and shirt colour were correct for my daughter. I'm thoroughly creeped out by this, as creeped out as I was when my daughter used to wave and say goodbye to her closet when we get her up from naps and in the morning, when she was around two. I'm unsure what to make of this. I live in a house with shadow people when I was my daughter's age and really don't want to deal with anything creepy ever again. I'm the fourth generation to live in our house. So we've been in the same spot for about 120 years. There's this large mansion just up the road. It takes maybe two or three minutes to reach by foot. It has a large yard and once owned several acres of farmland and pine forest. Now the house stands alone with a bunch of outhouses. The last person of the rather wealthy family to pass away was a woman. Let's call her Agnes for the sake of anonymity, about 10 years ago. She was widowed and childless very prim and proper and formal. 
My mother used to be friends with her foster daughter when she was young, and she recalls being afraid of Agnes, who was strict and firm and insensitive. I would later perceive Agnes as proper and strict, but also kind and friendly, and I spent many hours at the house in her company as an older child and preteen. The house itself had two floors, and I never visited the upper level. I was strictly confined, mostly by choice, to the kitchen and the small recreational space where the TV was. When I first began popping by for a visit, Agnes's husband was still around. The thing about this house is, as my mother recalls, that it's always uninviting and eerie. It was very scarcely lit with gravel walks leading up to the house, either through the main entry or the unofficial entryway, fitted to allow horse carriages, etc. Mom would recall that her and the rest of the village girls would be iffy about walking past the house post nightfall, especially if alone. She recalls they never spoke of it. It was just a general feeling of being unnerved and watched. This feeling was present during the day as well, as per my own experience, and was tangible for as long as Agnes resided there. If you were walking up the gravelways, there'd always be a second pair of footsteps. You might write it off as an echo, but it would halt simultaneously with your own steps if you stopped. The large windows of every outhouse and extra building were always black, and you couldn't see through them at any time during the day. Although you would at times do a double take, as you think you might have glanced something in one of them. Another thing I remember clearly is refusing to go to the bathroom while I visited Agnes. On the way to the bathroom was a large hallway from which the staircase leading to the second floor split off. I would inherently never look up the stairs, because whatever oppressive sensation you felt within the house seemed to emanate from the second floor. It was as if it poured down from the stairs, and in the hallway, there was this giant mounted deer head whose eyes always seemed to be following your every move. I can't say I experienced a lot apart from these little details, and neither could my mom. But it was the entire feel of the house that left you feeling off. It was as if, as soon as you passed the gates, every sound died down, and you never felt completely alone. I remember hating passing a certain part of the gravel walkway that passed between two houses. It always felt as if someone was right behind you, as if whatever it was that was mirroring your steps had caught up to you by that point. Once you did pass, however, it would subside. This aura was very much persistent until Agnes passed away. As soon as she was gone, so was the aura of the house. There's a family consisting of a woman, three children, and a little spaniel living there now, and I haven't sensed any of the oppressive, hostile vibes since. The house feels like a completely regular old mansion now, rustic and fancy and regal. I haven't passed the gates for years, but when Agnes lived, the vibes radiated outside their bounds. You could feel it before you saw the house, and before you came within a hundred feet of its proximity. That's all gone. I can't help but wonder if Agnes's relatives, her entire ancestry, was waiting for her and lingering. Perhaps they were waiting for her to join them, and as soon as she did, they found peace. I have no answers, except for the fact that the mansion was notably hostile and oppressive in nature for at least 60 years, and then everything changed. What do you believe the culprit might have been, and why did it change? I was around nine years old. My room was small, and on the opposite side of my bunk bed is a large closet door mirror which covers the entire wall of the room. For around two weeks straight, I was suddenly peacefully awoken in the night, without any touches or noises. When I would look over, I would see a woman. Her body was shrouded in complete darkness without any distinguishable features. She wore a long white wedding gown and stood staring into the massive mirror. She never moved either, and wasn't looking directly at me, just forward. The first night I thought it was a dream, but then it happened again the night right after. I distinctly remember pinching myself as hard as I could to wake up, but realised I was totally conscious. I was never scared, and I even remember thinking to myself, why am I not? Then I would just cover myself in my blanket and drift back to sleep. After a week, I finally decided to tell my mother, 
who told me it's my dad pulling a prank on me. At the age of nine, I believed this. He told me he had some projector in my room displaying the images. My mom told me to scream for her when I see it again, and one night I was about to, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. The lady never bothered me. It wasn't at all scary to see her. To repeat, this happened every single night for about two weeks. Days later, like usual, I was awakened and saw the woman standing in a usual position. But something odd was next to her. A man, shrouded in complete darkness with zero features, was standing next to her, holding a hand. He was wearing a black tuxedo. Even then, I wasn't scared and went back to sleep. After that, I never saw her again. I was never awakened in the night randomly like that. It just all went away. When I was older and asked my mum about it, and she told me she knew that house had something very wrong with it. I knew it was haunted, but didn't want to scare me. She hadn't had any paranormal experiences with it, but knew something was up. I have some more stories from this house, but none even go near how insane this one is. The house wasn't some Victorian creepy mansion. It was a usual blue collar neighborhood house at the corner of a busy street. Each time I tell this story, I begin to cry. I have no idea why. I don't ever cry much, but for some reason, I'm tearing up just typing this alone. It's so odd. So a couple of nights ago, I had one of the scariest experiences of my life. I'm a soldier, stationed on Fort Bliss here in El Paso, Texas. I'm housed in East Bliss. So our barracks are relatively new, only about 12 years old or so. On Sunday, I went to bed around 10 o'clock so I could get to PT without being tired, and I had a strange dream. I had a dream that I was walking around the base and pigeons were landing on me and pecking my head, maybe one or two pecks and then flying away. They weren't aggressive or painful, they were light little taps on my head and around my head, and I kept swinging at them to shoo them away. However. When I got pecked around the 10th time, I woke up, and this is where it got weird. When I woke up, I felt five fingers lightly placed on top of my head. It wasn't full palm, it was like a basketball player holding a basketball with his fingertips, but with far less pressure. It was a soft touch, but when I opened my eyes, I could physically feel the fingers swipe away quickly, even to the point that I felt them slightly rub my scalp. I jumped up as fast as I could and turned my light on. I looked under my bed, at my window, in my closet, everywhere, trying to see if someone had got into my room. There was nothing. No sign of anyone being in my room or anything at all. I have no clue what happened, though I do have a theory that it could have been my hair moving from waking up. However, I know what it feels like when my hair moves while I'm laying down. It somewhat feels like bugs crawling on me. That feeling that night felt exactly like five fingers on my head to every detail and movement and even made a lot of sense to the weird dream I had. Does anyone have any logical theories of what it could have been? Or could it seriously have been something paranormal? I'm incredibly curious to know, or at least be able to explain what happened. So last night, my friend came over and spent the night. I go to bed pretty early, I would say a good two to three hours before everyone else, and so I'm usually the first up in my house with seven people. And I always go to bed watching Family Guy, but when I woke up, it was playing something else. And as I went up to change it, I heard my friend's voice from the other room say my name. Now, I know there were three problems. One. I just saw my friend laying down sleeping on the couch to my left. If he did wake up and called my name, he would have sounded tired as if he just woke up. But this sounded like his normal voice and was practically emotionless. Two, he rarely calls me by my actual name. And three, the voice sounded like it was coming way too far to be the guy right behind me. And luckily, I'm already a big fucking pussy when it comes to paranormal shit. And my sister's stories of demonic encounters in a dream didn't help. So I just looked down at the floor and walked back to the couch I was sleeping on. 
and covered myself with my blanket for a good 10 to 15 minutes, during which I think I heard something moving me behind me and my exposed legs didn't feel like they were being touched but kind of surrounded by something, if that makes any sense. She told me this story when I was younger and back in my hometown of Zacatecas, Mexico. Anyways, let's get started with the story. This story takes place around 25 years ago. During the night, my mom likes to take simple walks around to clear her head after a day's hard work. Because it's always hot and humid during the day, she uses this time to savor the cool breeze of the silent yet peaceful night. Without a doubt, my mom thinks it's going to be a regular stroll like always, but then she hears it. Near a small lake that is a little farther away from the town, there's this girl in a white dress, walking, but crying. As she's crying, she hears the phrase, Miss Hijos. My mom knew that this was Lorana, because every single person in Latin America knows of this woman. For those who don't know about La Llorana, there used to be a beautiful but poor girl who had fallen in love with a rich man. Both individuals felt the same amount of love and compassion for each other. They surely got married and had kids. They truly loved each other, or so she thought. The woman found out that her husband was having an affair from the constant disappearances in the middle of the night, catching them in the act. One dark night, she took the children out for an evening stroll before stopping near a lake. Because their children looked so much like their father, she threw them in the water and let them drown. Realising what she had done, the woman felt an immense regret and sadness swell up upon her soul, thus throwing herself into drown in the water with the kids. Because of her sins, she is to forever walk the earth in search of her kids, even though they have already passed to the other side. Her appearance is quite noticeable. She's always wearing a torn white dress while her eyes are crying blood. There are many variations of how she looks, but this is how my mom described it to me. My mom sees this woman crying near the lake. Whenever you see something that you didn't know existed, you can't help but stare at it. La Llorona felt as if someone was staring at us, so she turned around to make eye contact with my mom. Before I continue, when my mom told me this next part, she began to pray because this event scared the living hell out of her, asking for Jesus and the Guadalupe to give her strength. After praying, she continued with the story. My mom stared clearly into the eyes of this woman to see the torn dress, the pale face, the black bags under her eyes and the blood leaking down her eyes. My mom made eye contact with this woman for about a minute before it began to move towards her. My mom turns around and runs, full on sprint. When she arrived home, she got on her knees and prayed to the Guadalupe statue all night. When we came to America, she refused to let me go outside. Not even five minutes, because she feels that Yorona will get me. I believe her, because I constantly feel like something is watching me whenever I'm walking back home during the dark. When I was younger, my family lived in a run-down, terribly built and dangerous neighbourhood. It was the type of neighbourhood where hearing gunshots was quite frequent. I figured this information might be useful to determine the type of energy or figures we dealt with. We had multiple paranormal experiences at the old house, and that's one of the reasons I'm so glad we moved out. One of the experiences I remember most happened before school one morning. At that point in time, I lived with four of my current five siblings and both of my parents. But that morning, it had only been my eldest brother, a middle schooler, and I, an elementary student. He and I sit at our kitchen table, which was near the wall and had a clear shot of our small kitchen and the back door, while everyone else got ready for the day upstairs. We had been quietly eating cereal together when suddenly, the back door flew open and shut and a blurry black figure rushed into our house. It was so fast that it seemed to disappear the moment it arrived. 
my brother and I had both seen it. I know he saw it as well, because the moment it happened, we both shared a scared look and promptly stood up. He and I checked out our back door and found that it had been locked. There was no way anything could have come in because it had been locked, so we were both terrified. We went back to eating, but were shaken up by our experience. I remember being so scared as I finished my bowl of cereal. This is a small story, but it seems relevant. My brother told me one day, a long while later, that he remembered waking up in the middle of the night, only to see a disturbing face looking back at him. His bed was positioned with the foot of the bed facing the hallway, and I have no idea why he slept with his door open, but whatever. When he opened his eyes, he saw a tall black figure with no distinguishable features, except its glowing red eyes staring back at him. And of course, he remained still and silent, trying not to show any signs of movement or acknowledgement. Eventually, he managed to fall back asleep and never saw the figure again. I remember seeing shadows move in that home when everyone else was doing their own thing. The creatures never did anything that I was aware of, but they scared the hell out of me and my brother. My mom says she had some paranormal experiences there too, but I don't remember them. I'll ask her tomorrow. Thankfully, they didn't seem to follow any of us to the new house, which we lived in for five years now. The only experience I've had at this house was a chance encounter with a sleep paralysis demon and hearing inexplicable breathing in my own room sometimes, but those weren't enough to shake me up. So this story starts a while ago, when I was five. So just to give you an idea, you would open my door, and on the right is my dresser. And then on the far right is my bunk bed and a window. And then on the left is my TV and closet. So I slept in my bunk every night. However, I would wake up every night to see a body part or dead body in my bed. Also, my dad has a very strong haunting on this side of the family. My parents and I kind of wrote it off as just little kids' nightmares, since my mom doesn't really believe in spirits. Fast forward till I was seven, and I was still having these nightmares, and I started having nightmares about a girl in the corner of my room. She was beautiful, just like absolutely beautiful, and she had long black hair, and she wore a pretty white flowery dress. I started seeing her in real life, but only like little glimpses in the corner of my eye. It was really creepy, and as you might guess, I was old enough to understand that that wasn't a real person in my bedroom. So I started to see her get worse and worse looking every night, and she would start walking over to my bed, but I could only see her head since I was on the top bunk. She would lay beneath me in the bottom bunk until I fell asleep. I got brave one night and decided to ask her what her name was and why she was here. She said her name was Elizabeth, and she refused to answer my second question. She stopped coming after a while and then just stopped coming at all. Fast forward again to when I was nine and I started having really bad sleep paralysis every single night. It eventually went away and now I get it every few weeks. Anyways, when I was 11, we moved to Virginia. As soon as I got here, I decided to explore around, so I did. I saw a river and a pond and some other stuff, but then I saw a small forest that was a small area of loads of trees. I walked into the trees and I found some graves which creeped me out since they were obviously abandoned. I was reading along all of the names and found one called Elizabeth. That's when I turned and bolted back home. After that, I would wake up to her in my room again and she looked so awful this time. She was burned and her hair was frizzy and burned. She basically looked like she was just in a fire. I started waking up a few minutes earlier than when Elizabeth came. And another girl with blonde hair and a flowy light yellow dress would sit on my bed and tell Elizabeth to leave once she came. And Elizabeth would scream and leave. I was only 11, so this scared me so badly. I could cry, and the girl told me her name was Lillian. Anyways, Elizabeth eventually left, and I started having more dreams about a little girl pulling me out of bed. After that, I got super into spiritual things and saged my room and stuff. These dreams ended, 
And I found out a few weeks later, the people who were buried there died from a fire. I still see her in public or crowded places sometimes, but for now, she's gone. I'm not sure what happened with Lillian, but I haven't seen her since. However, I feel her presence. It had been a long spring cleaning my room. I wasn't done, so all the things I had under my bed were piled up in the corner of my room. I washed my face and brushed my teeth, as that's my usual night routine, and then I went to bed. I was really tired and was looking forward to getting some sleep. While laying in bed, I could feel the presence of someone in the room. I ignored it because it happens all the time. I closed my eyes and tried to sleep, and suddenly, I could feel someone slowly laying down beside me. I froze, and then I felt a hand brushing against my leg. Scared to my bones, I jumped up and turned on the light, and guess what? No one was there. Still scared and in shock, I sat down on the bed with my feet on the floor. And just when I finally calmed down, someone grabbed my leg from under the bed and tried to pull me down under. I quickly pulled up my legs and crawled to the corner of my bed. Tears started to fall down my cheeks and I took my phone and texted my brother and mother. I cried until my brother came into my room and I just knew one thing. I did not want to sleep in my room that night. And from now on, I always have a bunch of boxes and other stuff under my bed. The fan inside my cooker hood, which I've never used before, has activated twice. The first time it deactivated as soon as I entered the kitchen to check where the noise was coming from, and I did nothing else. The second time, a few minutes afterwards, it kept going until I switched the wrong lever, which is the one that turns on the cooker's hood lights. I noticed and turned off the correct lever, the one that turns the fan on or off. It should be noted that these levers take quite a bit of strength to be moved, but the creepier thing is that both times the fan deactivated for weird reasons. After this occurrence, I noticed that my cat was under my bed, which is something he only does when he's scared. After a while, he got out and very carefully walked towards the kitchen. He stood on the threshold and looked inside at a specific spot on the wall, not at the cooking hood itself, even standing on his hind legs. Needless to say, I could see nothing there. My cat was unusually tense and frightened, but he seems to be over it now. From age 8 to 14, I lived in a one-story house with a basement and garage with my parents and grandparents. Funnily enough, the basement was the least scary and weird part of the house. From the basement at night, you could hear footsteps constantly and the floorboard above creaking. There were weird incidents in the basements, but they happened far less often. Whenever we moved to the back room to sleep, instead of the basement, things only got weirder. It started with me seeing a woman covered in bandages sleeping next to my mother. I asked who she was, and my mother just dismissed me entirely, so I ignored it and fell asleep. Later. I saw a white orb bouncing sporadically in the bathroom closet. Once again, I told my, my mother, but she chalked it up to a firefly. Fireflies don't glow like that or move that fast. I heard a song playing, but no matter how hard I listened, I couldn't make out the lyrics. When I asked my mother if she heard that music, she said no. It played for hours before I eventually fell asleep, and it sounded so clear. So why couldn't I understand the words? The scariest was when I was laying in bed one day and I saw my sister walking down the hall while I was upside down on the bed. I called to her, but she didn't respond. So I turned around to put myself upright just as she stepped through the doorway. When I looked back, she wasn't there. And I realized the thing I thought was my sister didn't have a face. My grandfather also had weird experiences like shadowy figures walking around his bedroom. I once saw one in hours digging through things. Footsteps would echo through the halls at all hours of the night, 
despite everyone being asleep. The house creeped us all out, and all of us had weird feelings inside the house. We moved out a while after a tornado almost hit us. I haven't been back since, but sometimes think about what I experienced there. Has anyone heard the voice of their pets? My friend told me about a year ago that she heard one of her cats speak to her. Her cat said, move. Though she says it freaked her out, she rolled over and the cat jumped onto the bed and got comfortable. She said it was a very small, feminine voice. Not gonna lie, I loved hearing about this because I love hearing about unexplainable things. Then it happened to me. Last night, I was laying in bed trying to sleep. I was tired, but not sleeping. It had been probably an hour when I rolled over and became vaguely aware that my cat was walking around to my side of the bed. This is typical, as he likes to sleep with me. He didn't jump up, he just sat there, and I swear I could feel him staring at me. Again, not totally out of the ordinary, but I noticed it. Then I heard, oh, I'm hungry, in the most chilling, high-pitched, non-human voice very clear and direct in my head. It had me so shaken, I asked my husband if he had heard it. No, I didn't get up to feed him again. Aside from being completely freaked out and frozen in bed, he had both a bowl of dry food and an extra treat of wet food for dinner. I knew he was good, at least for the night. This has now happened to my friend twice and now myself. Am I going crazy? Did I really hear him? Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this?